welcome back and we're moving into our main conversation for today as we have three different representatives on set with us to have an open conversation about what we can do to break the culture of violence and abuse in the country. What we need to do, what we may be doing, um, and what we may have neglected. Uh, joining us this morning, we have the Executive Director for the National Committee for Families and Children, Margaret Nicholas. Mm -hmm. We have in the middle uh, the UNICEF Belize Country Representative, Dr. Susan Cassetti. And on the end, uh, we have Professional Counselor, Amy Jax. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. It is a very heavy morning this morning, and I, and I recognize that. I think most of us are at a loss as to how to come to terms with what has taken place in our country, specifically with the death of baby Alyssa Nunez. Um, from your perspective, obviously, working directly in the sector, what, would, what, what is your initial reaction to what has taken place? Dr. Cassetti? <laughs> sure. And my, my initial reaction is, as everybody else is, it's, it's an absolute tragedy. Um, and our hearts go out to the family, yes. um, the family of baby Alyssa. We, our hearts go out also to the family of too many others who've lost their children um, mm. needlessly, um, or their loved ones, or whose <laughs> lives have been shaken and shattered by senseless reckless violence yeah. um, and so we we are, are heartbroken at this series of tragedies um, but we refuse to believe that this is what will define us moving forward we are um, we are reassured to hear the outcry um, to see people taking a stand to reject the notion that this is what we must Step and sit back and accept. We are, um, our hearts are, uh, are warmed. We are really reassured as we see that people are coming together and saying no. Um, and we're, we're encouraged too by the conversation such as this one that is looking for solutions and ways that each of us can commit and involve ourselves in turning things around yeah. and making sure that we live up to our own um, aspirations and dreams for the community that we want to be. On the behalf of the National Committee for Families and Children, we would really like to express our deepest condolences mm -hmm. to the family. Um, it is really and truly a heart-wrenching situation. Because as you think that you know, you're moving strides towards alleviating this kind of situation, you see it happening over and over again. I think that the, <clears throat> the death marks a very tragic entity. To the, to the child's life and as Dr. Susan has said many other children um, I for me I am hoping that we do not only champion today but it continues because I think sometimes we're too reactive rather than being proactive yeah. and I think that as a society we really actually need to, to, to be more proactive yeah. and to stand up for what is right and in doing that it means that regardless of whom, regardless of whom, we have that duty because sometimes that is the problem. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we know, we see, but it's because it's our brother or our husband or our boyfriends, we, we, we refrain from yeah. saying anything. I think that this is a lesson well learned that we cannot take these things for granted. It is not to be taken a chance. Because once we see the signs, we need to do something so that we would not be sitting and mourning yeah. at death this morning. Yeah. That we would have been proud to wave our hands and say, I did cause that not to have happened. But yeah. we have to do regardless of who it is. Yeah. Because to me, that is the major problem. Now, Amy, the, the country is collectively <coughs> in a grieving process. Talk to us about uh, what that means and what we can expect in this process. As we look at how everything has unraveled since this news broke, mm -hmm. we can see that as a people, we have taken different stances. Some of us are looking for understanding. Some of us are trying to change the laws. Mm -hmm. Others of us are trying to seek vengeance. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we all have that right for our initial reaction. Mm -hmm. I echo what these ladies said. We're all mourning. We're all looking towards solution. And so the important part is to do something with our mourning. A couple weeks ago, we had a similar conversation with a crime we don't understand. Something, again, that happens very often in our country. This issue covers pedophilia. It covers incest. It covers child abuse. It covers probably domestic issues as well. So we have to look at everything. You are right in saying in everything you brought up this morning, we are brought to this issue because of baby Alyssa. Mm -hmm. But let's look at these other issues that show us a reflection of our country and how we may move forward with less violence and less criminality and how we can define ourselves as an understanding people who can move forward and address these issues that have mental health repercussions. Yeah. We are looking at antisocial behaviors, we're looking at mental health diagnoses, we are looking at grief. And so in this time of our grief, it is important for us to take the time acknowledge our first initial reaction, and then decide to do something about it. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that I want to say, and, and, it, and it, it is not casting blame, but really an acceptance. We're doing something wrong. We're failing our children. We have children being shot in their street. We have children being shot in the middle of their sleep, in their homes, in their beds. We have children being left with a stepfather who should not have done what he did, but it happened either way. We have some of the worst crimes taking place to the young and innocent in our country, and it feels like we are failing them. How do we move, from your perspective, and, and I think you know, anybody who works in social work, this is a part of their daily life, and they can't just sit and mourn like we are right now. They have to move towards solutions. So if we're to say, what we need to focus on with our children so that the violence and the abuse will not haunt them the way it is at this point. What are some of the first steps? Malini, um, you're absolutely right. Um, six out of 10 children under the age of three um, will experience extremely violent physical abuse in Belize every year. Oh, six out of ten, that's <coughs> the data that we have. The different types of physical violence that are reported, uh, you know, um, we don't have sufficient data on that. We know sexual abuse is among it, but we also know that just violent discipline and aggression on children zero to three, these are our youngest children, and we know that the long-term effects of that on the child's mental mm -hmm. health, the child's academic performance, the child's social behavior, are long, uh, they, they can be lifelong. So what we have been working with the NCFC, Ministry of Human Development, Health, Education, to try and do uh, uh, three main things. It's really focusing on strengthening communication to mobilize communities, parents and families to act, to change and to understand better how their role mm -hmm. as parents, as caregivers, as the front line for protection and support for children, can how they can play that role effectively prevent violence and also support children to grow in a, a safe and supportive way. Yeah. The second thing is really strengthening services, strengthening the systems for response. When our laws fail, when our law enforcement fails, when there is no access to justice, um, and when communities disengage and when we individually disengage from our role in creating a system that protects and preserves the right to life and, and safety for children, then our responses fail. So really system strengthening and making sure that our laws, the law enforcement, and, and the, the roles for individuals are clear and that there is accountability, mm -hmm. that we are calling on one another to be accountable, as you said, in every role that we play, making sure that we're calling on one another to be accountable. Um, so strengthening of systems is the second. And then the, th the third, is really making sure that we have better data. When people trust that the systems are going to respond, they report. Mm -hmm. 
But now, because we don't have sufficient trust in our systems to respond, to ensure access to justice, we don't have a good idea of just how extensive and what kinds of violence children are experiencing. So we've got to get confidence in the systems, we've got to get people together to work um, and, and challenge the norms and the, the tolerance that there is to different forms of violence. Um, and then we've got to make sure that that translates into data that will inform targeted, effective <coughs> action um, at the community level. Looking at this particular incident, I can't help but notice that the parents are very young. Mm. Yeah. The alleged perpetrator is himself very young. He's 21 years old. Um, you're, you're, you're all women. Um, how I'm looking at, I'm trying to look at what can be put in place to assist this mother because I, I, I can only imagine what she's going through mentally, emotionally, and otherwise. Mm -hmm. What can be put in place to be able to assist her, either from the, the position of the respective organizations here and from a counseling perspective? Mm -hmm. You should start with the organization. Okay. Well, um, for, for me, I would look to the Human Services Department. I believe that there needs to be a thorough investigation into this entire matter, and not only this one, but anyone. Mm -hmm. That because where a child has died, then one must need to look around and see if, the, if there are other children in there. Okay. Um, what kind of support can we give to the mother? Because obviously she needs help, she's young. And so we would have to look at the Human Development Department. We may have to refer to Women's Affairs or whomever. So that, so that as you are rightly saying, that it, it, it gives effect to all the different services that she may need because she went to work. Because that is what the news said, that she yeah. went to work. So obviously she has, apparently has to work. So, um, you know, there, there, there's a whole, I, um, the whole thing of the counseling, and helping the whole family. Because it's not just her, but it is the entire family. And so it is for the department to get into the family to find out what is going on with that family and many other families. And so I believe that, and, and I'm hoping that the recent um, technical working group that we have put together as, as late as last year, um, would, would that through this mechanism, that we were better able to service and to help in the child protection system. Because that child protection system is made up of everybody, all persons within the child um, protection sector. And we have looked at even the protocols and how that works. Because as I listened a while ago, I heard uh, uh, some complaints about how it was managed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have any evidence as exactly, but that is what I heard. And so even that, because we have to look at the, the, the entire system. When a child gets hurt like this, what happens? What process does it go through? Does the Human Development Department go in and get the kind of service that they need? Is there that quick response to a child that may save a child's life? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to note that the, the, the police are doing what they're supposed to do in terms of the arrest and, and whatever. Um, when it comes to the whole end of the day, it is the DPP who makes the decision as to what the charges should be. But I think that more important is that we need to ensure that our facilities can bring us the kind of evidence that we will need to get some conviction because that is, again, another problem. Mm -hmm. Because if children are constantly <coughs> being molested and people are constantly walking, then it sends a very, very negative message yeah. in terms of well, maybe it's, it's okay, and it is definitely not okay, you know. And one of the reasons why we also did, we launched the, the, the videos and we are continuing to, to, to make preparations to have them all, all over the place is so that people could understand what sexual offenses is, what, what, what is statutory rape, what, what it is all about, because people need to know. People need to know that there is a mandatory regulating um, regulation that you have a duty not only, you have a legal and in some places you have a moral, but you're supposed to report. And, and, and the reporting is extremely important. And so, um, based on what Marlene has said, it seems that there is need to, to, to turn up the speedometer. 
so that um, these processes are, are, are done earlier rather than later. Mm -hmm. um, because the whole issue of parenting, you know, that is a whole other matter, you know, because um, the thing is that a lot of times people believe and people truly believe that whenever the state intervenes, it is being intrusive mm -hmm. because these are my children yeah. and I raise my children. But the, the, when, when, when this is happening, the state has a duty yeah. to step in. To everyone. Yeah, to it has a responsibility to everyone. To everyone. So can, can we jump into that one a wait, little wait, bit more? I'm not yeah. done. Go ahead. Because <laughs> yeah. I haven't had my time. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I, what, when, you, when we look at counseling itself, yeah. it has to go through that system first. Yeah. And so the capacity to building is where we have to focus. And that increasing the speedometer is vital. Because where was the social worker at KHMH? They don't have one. You need to have something as simple as that in place for them to be able to, to collect around. Yeah. The police should not be the, well, the police would be able to intervene as well, but they don't, they don't have a social worker either. In, in any country that you go, the hospital itself has one or several social workers that deal with the issues that come in. Yeah. Someone trained specifically for emergency situations for medical things. They are the ones who would contact the Department of Human Services. And the Department of Human Services, apart from doing the investigation, they do offer counseling services in a timely manner, but do they have someone full-time who works with them? So we have to go back yeah. and make sure that we have enough trained people in our field. How many counselors do you know? How many people do you know trained in counseling yeah. with at least a, a master's who is trained to yeah. work with someone? Yeah. Someone who has the ability to talk to the families because we are doing intervention at several levels. You are right. It's not just the mother or the father. Yeah. It's the entire family that needs counseling. It's the, it's the co-workers of the parents. They both work somewhere. It is everyone. We it's are all going village. through yeah. grief. Yeah. And so we all need something like this accelerates our grief process. What you have been doing on the news, all those Facebook posts where people can express their <coughs> anger, all of those are ways that we grieve. Yeah. But when we look at it, we have to look at our capacity for it. You know, I think, and I'm glad you brought that point up. There's several things that stood up, but oftentimes we don't, ta we don't put, connect all the dots. And, and, and we've spoken about several things here, parenting issues, and I know I've always spoken, I think high school education should include parenting education. I think it's the only way you'll get them before they become parents, instead of having to force them into a system. So I, I'd like your thoughts on that. But also when we talk about social workers, we know the human services are on, they're, they're understaffed or maybe they're overworked. Oh. That's a better way to say it. Uh, they have more cases than any social worker should ethically have. But they need to be able to address all of these issues. We have a budget coming up at the end of the week, and this is not political. People always think if you speak budget, it's, pol it's not political. Are we looking at what's going into human services? Are we looking at scholarships for persons to get professionally trained as child psychologists to help children deal with the trauma they're experiencing in this country? Are we? hiring more professional counselors as well? Are we staffing the KHMH with social workers? So sometimes we don't, like I said, connect the dots. Um, and, and we just see when something like this case takes place and we don't see where all, all the slippages take place. So let's talk about some of these issues here. We, we can tackle maybe first the, the human resources available in the child protection system mm -hmm. and maybe where more needs to be done or more mm -hmm. uh, funds, focus, training needs to go. I think the, what I'd like to... I think she has already answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, I, what I'd like to say is that I think our greatest opportunity is in leveraging the most powerful human resource base that we have and that is community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because unless we prevent, yeah. unless we enlist every parent every community member to know 
what their duty is, mm -hmm. to know how they can fulfill that duty. What are the small things that you can do yeah. as a neighbor, as a parent, as a teacher? whatever the role you play in the community, what are the things that you can do to make our communities safer, more supportive for children? Mm -hmm. That is a really critical issue. And so for us, communication is important. And these conversations, as you said, are critical in getting us to stop, reflect, and to find practical, simple things for us to, to do as a start. Um, that's, that's important. Um, now, in, in Belize, we're working with the Ministry of Human Development and um, the Ministry of Education and Health to strengthen the capacity of community-based workers to go out to visit families mm -hmm. in, um, in, in rural communities and to provide support to parents in their home. That is <coughs> one, you know, investing in capacity of yeah. workers at different levels yeah. to step in and provide support is another alternative um, that can add to the education and the higher skilled social workers that you might have. So we need to try and make sure that we translate obligations and duties from different sectors mm -hmm. into quality standards yeah. across the entire spectrum of the workforce mm -hmm. in different sectors. But, and that only complements the communication and engagement with communities that we're having to create a massive, um, a massive human workforce and partnership um, to, to, to the, the goal of protection um, of children and prevention of violence. So I just wanted to say that yeah. because, yes, the, the ideal is to make sure we have highly trained people, yeah. but then we have more than that that we absolutely must tap into. But we don't want them to need, <laughs> exactly. need them. Right. Yeah, but, so. but right. This speaks to the levels of intervention mm -hmm. that we we have to have mm -hmm. we the primary the secondary the tertiary so we have to have that prevention that communication we have to have the screening for those people who need it and we have to have the treatment those are the three levels that any organization will look at and those are the three levels where we have to build capacity but who will train the community mm -hmm. so it is a bottom down top up it feeds it it feeds each other you know so there has to be that communication but there has to be the capacity at all three levels as well so where we come in is how can do you know how to identify um signs of abuse do you know how to identify um, characteristics of someone who has who is a sexual offender and so part of that communication is teaching that and having people in the country who will be able to go into the schools and talk to the teachers people who will go to the police and talk to them mm -hmm. when we look at these mental health issues how many schools and how many organizations make time to train their their employees in these things. Mm -hmm. And the, it has started already. I have done some of these trainings. I have heard that um, the Ministry of Health goes in and they have their mental health segment that they work with the police, they work with the different departments, they mm -hmm. work with private and public organizations. And these are steps that we have started. And what Miss Margaret said is we have to, you know, accelerate it, increase the spe speedometer, as she said. Yeah. And so it is a, a holistic <coughs> way that we have to start looking at it. It's not just the laws, it's not just the counselors, it's not just one thing, but we as a community have started this discussion and it's important for us as a community to keep the discussion going. Violence toward women, it's the month to talk about it. Children, it's the month to talk about it. So we can make children's month and women's month every month mm -hmm. <laughs> and and these are the things that we have to talk about awareness yeah mm -hmm. i like that that there is a focus in this conversation on community mm -hmm. because in all of what we're discussing here i can't help but think about failing canon and mm -hmm. that particular case and how that unfolded in san pedro mm -hmm. in 2017 where you have members of the community who came forward afterwards mm -hmm. in the media saying that, look, the signs were there. We called. We called, but response was too little, too late. The child had already lost her life when this became an issue where we're now having conversations. And this isn't necessarily mm -hmm. limited to sexual abuse of children. This in, the, in this case, there's an allegation that it was physical abuse. And neglect. And neglect, yeah. right? That resulted in the loss of life here. Mm -hmm. 
the role of the community, <clears throat> I think, is, is multifaceted in the way we look at families and parenting and um, being able to determine what is right and wrong and in which direction we should go. Do you guys believe that perhaps the community, in a sense, is losing its, its direction in terms of how we look at the values of parenting? That is something well, that, that is a controversial issue because mm -hmm. every society will evolve. As I always think about my role in the community, mm -hmm. I'm a counselor because you don't have an auntie you trust anymore. You know, so we look, we have to look at it from that perspective as well. What are our morals? Who taught the current parents to be parents? Right? And, and it's a discussion I will have on a day to day basis. Why can, can I judge my society when I'm the one who also doesn't know my neighbor's name? You know? Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at this breakdown of our society and instead of just saying, oh, we have to start doing something about it. We have to switch back over to that community mentality. We are not at the point where we can pay for individual services to be, to have someone to confide in, to have someone to help feed us. You know, all of these things. Mothers, single mothers nowadays complain, oh, family court only has this minimum amount that the father has to give and I have to pay for diapers, and I have to pay for formula, and I have to pay for transportation, and I have to pay for the babysitter, and I have to pay for this and that. And I hear these chants from mothers and, and single fathers on occasion, mm -hmm. you know, on a weekly basis. So we have to look at how we can look, how we can change the support system on, and how to see the new family. I interrupted Miss Margaret. Yes. No, I was just going to say in response to the, where the community cries out, because that is what you were talking about, that the community was actually taking on its role. Mm -hmm. And you were saying, they're saying that they were not getting any response. I think therein is where the, com the community needs to then hold mm -hmm. us accountable. That is the time when we protest and that is the time when we make sure that our voices are heard. Because too many times you hear that people report and then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And that is, to me, that is extremely sad. And when a community is willing to, 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 to let it say a dog and let you know what is happening, you must pay attention. Because normally people don't want to um, report due to confidentiality issues. Yeah. People don't want to go before the courts and so on and so forth. So even that we need to, 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 to um, encourage and assist and support the community and to say to them, when these things happen, you report again, and you report to different people, or you then it is a time, because we cannot be reporting to the police and to human development and to whomever, and we are not getting any responses yeah. and, and no support because children are being hurt. So if somebody is saying to you that something is happening to a child, that complaint should be received and properly investigated. Yeah. Because where there is smoke, there is fire. So I, 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 I um, applaud the people who want to, to make these reports. And, and, and I know what you're saying is true because even with teachers, because there is this monetary reporting regulations, but you have teachers who are saying, I would want to report, but I cannot report because I'm afraid that the principal might be unhappy. Mm -hmm. They all have a legal duty to report. Yeah. It's a mandatory reporting regulation. And you have to understand it is not about the mother or the it's about the child. child if your whole whatever you do is based on the principle that it is in the best interest of a child yeah. you don't have anything to be afraid of yeah. because you're taking care of an innocent little person yeah. and that is all that you're supposed to, to 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 think about in terms of when you see things happening yeah. but i am saying hold us accountable man yeah. who you know? do you call do you call the police you first or you call human services When first? there is a problem with a child, you call human services. Okay. Because human services <coughs> should have the, well, they have the capacity mm -hmm. to go out there and do the necessary investigation and so on and so forth. And then if necessary, then they would call in the police. Mm -hmm. um, even for teachers who are not counselors and who are not expert in this field, we discourage them from, from trying to, to, to resolve these issues because you make them worse. Mm -hmm. So and hence the reason why you call human services. And human services, as I know, have people on 24 hours duty. Mm -hmm. You could always call them and somebody will be there. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and where human services is overloaded, as we all know, then they would refer to counselors or they have the committee rehab who also have counselors in yeah. there. Because a lot of times the, the, the normal, regular social worker may not be able to, to, to really and truly address some of the complex, because what we are talking about here are complex yeah. issues. Mm. They are very complex, they're very complicated, you know, so I just wanted to, to mm. say that in regards yeah. to um, yeah. what and, he and said. And I think the complexity of the issue is something that we miss sometimes because we may feel reporting one abuse and somebody comes in and takes away the children or charges the parent is enough, but, but there's so much more that is happening, <coughs> whether it's uh, financial issues, whether it is domestic violence, and, and many other things that could potentially be taking place. Mm -hmm. um, coming back to the issue of parenting, though, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I noticed you spoke about community, and, and there are, there's COMPAR, there's a roving caregiver mm -hmm. program where you're going out teaching parents how to interact with their children. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that perhaps can be able to kind of make the shift within the communities that, that we want to see, that, uh, that we go back to the village-like mentality where we're all looking out for the best interest of the children? I think it's Im important, to, it's important to, to know that we can't go away from this discussion um, feeling that we're at a, a dead end. Mm -hmm. There's so many examples of people who are doing the right thing, yeah. of people who are making a difference in the lives of, of children, of parents, and turning that around mm -hmm. every single day. Unfortunately, the tragic news of cases like this brings to the, brings to the top um, the, the most egregious violations. But every day, everywhere across Belize, there are people who are walking the streets, sitting with parents, working with, with children, and helping to turn lives around. Um, the Metamorphosis Program, which we support in, in Belize, in Belize Southside, works with very vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. But not, it doesn't stop there. Um, with Restore Belize, we work with, um, with families, with parents, very young parents, because we recognize that there is no silver bullet. There's no one single action that you can provide, whether it's counseling or reporting, that is going to address the underlying complex set of issues. Yeah. You need a long-term um, system of comprehensive support that will build bridges to services, that will ensure that there is a support network that is placed around a vulnerable, um, a vulnerable family to ensure that the, the children and the parents are, uh, are protected. If I can segue into another area of discussion here. Mm -hmm. As a reporter, mm -hmm. I was alarmed last week when I realized that within the span of a week, I had covered three stories where kids yeah. either mm -hmm. got shot yeah. or lost their lives to gun violence. Yeah. And while, yes, we're, we're, we're discussing and centering our focus on uh, other forms of, of violence against children, mm -hmm. that in itself, to me, stands out. Because here you have a 12-year-old boy, mm -hmm. a standard six student, who was shot and killed mm -hmm. while standing with his mother waiting for a bus to go home to Ladyville. Mm -hmm. That was one in incident. Mm -hmm. Another incident, mm -hmm. the 11-year-old the, the, the was in his yard. Mm -hmm when gunfire erupted and he caught a stray bullet. Mm -hmm. And then the third incident, within the span of a week here, mm -hmm. the toddler was in, the, in his house. He was dancing to music being played by his family for him mm -hmm. when gunfire erupted and he has now lost three toes mm -hmm. and probably won't walk, won't be able to walk. These are instances where children are not necessarily being targeted, but they are being injured as a result of the actions of adults. What can we do in, in your, in your uh, minds? What, what can we do to be able to address instances such as these where children are being directly affected by the negligent and criminal actions of adults? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think first of all, we need to call the crimes what they are. Mm -hmm. We need to call these crimes by their name. Any crime against a child is unjustifiable and inexcusable and it needs to be prosecuted with the full force of the law so that there is a visible action that restores the faith in, um, in the community in that 
system of law enforcement and justice. Um, now, I think that um, the other thing that we've seen, we've seen the series, and this is what compelled UNICEF to speak so forcefully, we've seen the series of reports of children, children find themselves, finding themselves in the way of essentially criminal activity. Mm -hmm. We need to address the issue of gun violence in terms of access to arms and control of these arms. We need to address the issue of corruption that underlies the, the, the situation that has allowed these arms to be so readily accessible and utilized on the streets um, to, to violate the right to life um, for, for children and adults. Um, and so again, we need a holistic response. The first thing is acknowledging the issue, calling it by name, and mm -hmm. ensuring that there is accountability in the law enforcement, whose mm -hmm. duty it is to protect and to address the issue of proliferation of arms, to ensure that there is accountability um, uh, uh, on the people that have failed in their duty to protect, yeah. um, and ensure that, that is really, that's really used to reinforce the faith, restore the faith in the community that something will be done and that this is not the direction in which we are, you know, we're going to go as a community. Speaking to the um, rights of a child that these two organizations rally toward, we are looking at a society of children who grow up with trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma from many angles. We have domestic violence at home that many of our children live with throughout our country. We have the gun violence that a lot of our children, specifically in our urban areas, grow up with. I remember a talk I did last year, a, a little talk I did with some children, and majority of them are accustomed to gunfire. Mm -hmm. and, and that is scary. Yeah, they have a protocol as to what to do when they hear gunshot. Yes, yeah. and, and when we look at incest, um, child sexual abuse, these are things that have been happening throughout mm -hmm. our history as a country as well. And so we have to, like, like you said, Dr. Susan, we have to address these issues by name and in order for the roving caregivers and for people to be aware of, um, for them to teach it, they have to be comfortable saying these things and talking about these well, things. Well, that was, I, I really want to go there because I think, and I can imagine, because people are watching right now, sucking their teeth and say, oh, but that no work, that no work. There is a subculture of violence that we tolerate, accept as our norm. And I think we can clearly say that uh, with, the, with all the, the instances that you point out and, and you mentioned as well just in one week. And we talk about how important it is to have these conversations, um, to, to openly discuss on TV, in your house, in your workplace. But how do we keep the conversation honest? Mm -hmm. How do we not become protective if I work in the police department and say, well, it's not my fault, it's a DPP. And if the DPP says, it's not my fault, the investigation but uh, didn't but give if me you look well, at let, it let me finish, let me finish okay. though. If it goes to court and there's not a high enough conviction rate, if we look around and say, well, the neighbor knew something, or the neighbor said, I call human services and human services didn't respond, how do we keep it honest? I understand many people out there are out there putting out, put, doing the work. Mm -hmm. They're in the fields and they're doing the best that they can in their own little corners. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously not manifesting the type of effect that we want. But my, my fundamental question is, how do we keep it honest? Mm -hmm. my, my response to it wasn't a response. It was a commentary yeah. that I, I, was, I, I would have cut you. But it still is, if I am being beaten up at home, mm -hmm. how am I honest in that? How am I genuine in that? Will I go and tell my child this? Do I hide it? And so we have to look at that. How many families involved with the police witness domestic violence in their own home? Mm -hmm. How many people throughout different segments of society, we're not looking at just the urban or the rural populations. Like you said, we have an underlying acceptance of violence. So we have to look at it as individuals and see and be honest with ourselves as to, am I accepting violence? And what am I doing about it? And what am I teaching my child about violence? It goes back to parenting. It goes back to acknowledging what is violence. Well, you know, he done beat me or she done really do it, but I am broken inside because every day I hear you're not good enough. Every day I hear 
everything you do, you have to do it better, you know? So we have to look at that idea of our culture when it comes to violence and see how we can start addressing those by making the, the commercials that say this is violence toward you mm -hmm. and having the, the resources for people to come out and say, you know, if I walk away from my abusive spouse, I have somewhere to go. Yeah. I have someone who will listen to me. Yeah. And these are things that when we look at the laws, when we look at the resources, it's going to take some time to address it is a shift in our culture that we are looking toward, yeah. and it's going to take a, time, a, a while to shift. Absolutely. But these conversations, especially when they are happening on a consistent basis, keeps our mind on it. Yeah. So we can look at ourselves and we can look internally and we can look in the mirror and say, I don't deserve this. Yeah. I can speak about it and I can be honest. Yeah. Well, I believe that um it's, it's, a, it's a whole lot of issues that we, we, we have here yeah. because um, the whole issue of domestic violence and violence on a whole, yeah. um, it is somewhat, to some extent, we, we actually tolerate it um, because it is happening, we know it is happening, but the tolerance might come out of need because sometimes that is what it is. Um, the tolerance might come out of the fact that it's a cycle mm, that I might have, <coughs> it has been, <coughs> sorry, it has been perpetrated on me, I, I perpetrated it on, on my children and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, like I said before, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. And so, like the counselor is saying, people want to be out of these kinds of relationships, but there's a lot of dependency as well. And a lot of times children are apart of these violent situations and so they become as you rightly said some of them become immune they know what to do they live in in areas that it happens so frequently that they now could distinguish between a pop shot and a gunshot because mm -hmm. sometimes i wouldn't know the difference but yeah. they would know you know and so it, it is a lot of dependency it is a it's a matter that uh you know as, as was said before there has to be more resources. People have to be more independent. And people don't get to that place until they really get to that place, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Because um, you, you, you might say, or I might say, why is Marilyn is still there? But it is serving some purpose for you. It might have been the best life you ever had growing up as a child. Because, and that's why I'm saying it is so complex. And here's the reason you know, we have to help people, we have to have the counseling for people to understand that these are not acceptable things, but there has to be along with it the alternative. Because if we don't have the alternative, then we have a problem. Because if you're going to tell me to leave my husband and I don't have a job and I don't know where else to go, I am going to stay there because I have three yeah. children and I, and I need to mind, yeah. I, I need him to support me. Yeah. You know, and if I don't have the kind of educational background mm -hmm. that will allow me to get a job like his that i can take care of then i will and also i sometimes you know i live in areas that are are, are crime ridden um and, and and that is where i live you know and so i i see it every day so it is a it's, it's a it's a really it's a collective responsibility on how we really and truly and as susan said there's a lot of guns all over the place where are these guns coming from I mean, I am amazed. Every other young person owns a gun mm -hmm. or have access to a gun. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for me, that speaks volume mm -hmm. in terms because, you know, it's, and, and again, the other thing that we have to look at, if you go to court and the court does not give you justice, then it seems that that is what you do. You take justice into your own hand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is why children are affected because even when people want to take revenge, as was mentioned earlier, even if a child is present, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And then that speaks to what is happening in the mind. Yeah. So it is also a matter of getting into the mind of people. What, what is it that we're thinking about these days? Yeah. You know, where have, every, you know, it, it's a lot of things. How much harm would you have experienced for you, you know? to no longer take into account the life of an innocent uh, exactly, child? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and you believe I, that if you, like, if you do me something and I kill your child, I hurt you enough. 
the way that, and, and it is that kind of thing. We do not have those kinds of resources to really and truly get into the minds of people yeah. because we, 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 we work with the gang, we work with gangs as we do. Um, we try to do mediation, yeah. but it, 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 needs a little, it, it, it needs more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really and truly a complex matter for, for, I know. for us to talk and, about. And I really want us, because we're moving into the last <coughs> portion of, of the conversation very quickly, um, but I don't want us to walk away feeling overwhelmed. There is a feeling of being helpless in our society. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you mentioned domestic violence, and it simply takes me back to the fact that we had outrage the week before with the murder, suicide, and domestic violence. We had outrage with the murder of the 12-year-old. Now we have outrage over uh, baby Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And it is very <coughs> glaringly obvious that the social issues in this country are not being managed. Uh, it's out of control. It is beyond what, what we can even digest as people now. We are revolted by the latest case, and we should be. And we should have been from the first child died and from the first teenager died. But how do we move away from this helplessness? How do we just say, this country, I, I live here, but this country really gone. How do we move to action? Yeah, I think just as the first thing in the grieving <coughs> is to stop and to take stock of what's happened, yeah. internalize that so that you can recognize it and think you know, um, constructively about how to move on. Um, how, you, how we move on requires, again, that we stop, take stock of what we are doing right and what we do have in mm -hmm. terms of the re resources, the positive actors, the positive things that are, are going on, and then to build from there. We saw children this last weekend yes. start um, through the children's advisory um, bodies, start a, a movement to call on children in the communities to rally, to get, you know, to get into their communities and to call for adults to commit to protecting them. That's incredibly encouraging for us that children, the next generation on, that they get it and that they're willing to use the resources available to them to reach out, to communicate, to encourage one another and to to share this belief that we can actually do better. Mm -hmm. They're talking about, let's report what we see. Mm -hmm. Let's call our, um, our, our, police, our police force to be accountable, to respond to the things that we're reporting. So the things that we're talking about now, yeah. we need to see greater transparency in the actions that are undertaken to respond to the, the challenges that are brought to, um, brought to the attention of different authorities. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, having the power, for, the power of, of, of the community, the power of the masses, is really important. We need to make sure that we keep engaged with this community and reinforce the positive action that's already underway. Um, and so we're really hoping to see that. Yeah. Um, there are examples from uh, countries, from other countries, Jamaica, um, from South Africa, from Sudan, where really by putting in place um, capacities in the police, um, a family and child protection unit, making sure that we skill up the existing staff in the yeah. police to recognize um, what some of the, the greatest violations might be and how they individually can respond and engage better in the community to prevent and to respond. Yeah. We're also seeing communication, a hotline being established so that in, in many countries so that communities and families know a number that they, that they can reach mm. um, and the parenting support such as what we're putting in place. So we need to build on all of these positive examples and resources and join hands with the community actors that are already doing really great things. Anything else? Okay, I think just to, to add a little to what Susan has said or just to say that I agree with what she has said. Um, we just need to speed up, like I said. Mm -hmm. And the NCFC needs to do more, much more advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, we are hosting a meeting sometime next week, I think the 14th, to look at this very serious problem with several actors mm -hmm. and in an, in an effort to um, advocate and to see you know, what changes we can make other than the ones that we already have on the table yeah. to get some new ideas. But I think I want to also join in with Mr. Caetano in saying that this nation needs a lot of prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think that we must keep God in the center of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we have to pray for our children and our families because I think that is critical. Yeah. Because a lot of times we don't remember him. 
and it is important that we do that. Yeah. To add on to what they are saying, or, or to summarize a bit, is we also need the community involvement as well. We need the community to police them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need the community to police the media. We need the community to demand more and to make sure that the community is expecting us to do more. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, we have these incidents that come up every so often and people are outraged. But why are we outraged every three months? Why are we outra outraged every week? We have to move on from this reaction of grief and we have to move on and we have to establish as a community how we will look, proceed differently, mm -hmm. how we will look and take the next step to do. Mm -hmm. We have already reacted, we have already been outraged, let us do something about it. Thank you very much for being here and having this conversation uh, to start off the week. We really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about Early Childhood Stimulation Month. That's coming up after the break.